Welcome to the first ever Multi Angle Matters online event, Ask the Authors Live. I'm Flo from Multi Angle Matters, and I'm joined with my colleague Laura, who's in the headphones. Um, she's dealing with the technical side of Zoom today. Um, so the idea of this event was to highlight the three most recent books in the bilingual education and bilingualism series, which unfortunately missed out on conferences this year. Um, the series has been going since 1995, and uh, so far we've got 123 books in the series, um, with many more in the pipeline. And we are delighted to be joined today with the book series editors, Nancy Hornberger, who's Professor Emeritus of Education at the University of Pennsylvania, and Wayne Wright, who is Professor and Barbara I. Cook, Chair of Literacy and Language at Purdue University, as well as the authors of the three most recent books in the series. So we have Maria Cody from the University of Florida with her book, The Coral Way Bilingual Program. Got, thanks Wayne. We've got uh, Kimberly Adelia Helmer from the University of California, Santa Cruz with her book, Learning and Not Learning in the Heritage Language Classroom. And we have Katie Henderson from the University of Texas at San Antonio and Deb Palmer from the University of Colorado Boulder with their book, Dual Language Bilingual Education. So just to give you a quick rundown of the event uh, schedule, we're going to have a discussion between the series editors and each author individually about their book. And then we'll open it up for a group discussion between everybody. Um, and then at the end, there will be a chance to uh, for some audience questions. So if you have any questions during the event, then please do use the Zoom Q&A uh, tool to ask your questions and we will choose some from there and ask them at the end. Okay, I think that's everything from me. So uh, we'll start with our first author, which is Maria Cody, uh, introducing her book. Great, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for being here. I can see in the chat that there are people saying hello from all over the world. And, and um, if there's any upside to the context that we're currently in, it's that we're able to be together in a virtual space and really share in ways we haven't been able to in the past. So hello and welcome and thank you so much. A special thanks to Flo and Multilingual Matters for organizing. And I want to kick off uh, the book about Coral Way by saying a special thanks to Wayne Wright and to Nancy Hornberger. And um, the reason I want to say that is because the Coral Way story is not a long story, um, or it actually is a long story over time, but it's written in a very short book. And um, it takes a lot of courage for series editors to look at a book um, that has a, a history and something to say and a story to tell and realize that, that it might not go through several different editions over time. It may be just the story. Um, we can talk about that after, but it, it was their risk. Um, it was their courage to take a risk on this book, and I really appreciate it. Um, I know I only have a few minutes, so I'd just like to give you an overview of the book and why I, I wrote it, why I think it's really important and why I feel it's important today um, of all times um, in uh, the year 2020. Uh, the story of Coral Way, as many of you may know in the audience, really began much before 1963 when the doors of Coral Way Elementary School opened on September 3rd. It's a story really about um, multilingual children and a socio-political environment and ways that educators from different linguistic backgrounds could come together and think about the way the way education can be optimized and work, not only for children in the school, not only for immigrant children, but really for um, all children in the United States. It was a story, it is a story of educational vision and commitment. And so it was really a joy to write this book. Um, by way of overview, Coral Way opened in 1963 and started with the first three years of education in what became to be known today in our world is dual language education. I think that's an abbreviation for uh, two-way immersion education programs, which is a small subset of uh, a multitude of bilingual education programs in the United States and across the world. And as um, the series editors encouraged me to write, and I really appreciate it in the book, is that uh, the United States, of, like many countries, has a long history of bilingual education. So prior to Coral Way Elementary School, there was bilingual education. What I found in writing this is how important it was to document our past and our story in order for us to blaze a trail into the future uh, that includes equity, justice, and lessons learned from the past 
um, both in terms of scholars and, um, and, and teachers and educational leaders and citizens of the world. So that's what I wanted to say to welcome you this morning or this afternoon from where you're at uh, about the book. Thanks very much, Maria. And I think now Nancy and Wayne have some questions for you. Maria, that was a beautiful introduction and you really, um, it was a great way to sort of uh, focalize, focus on the, the purpose of your book and the, its value, its tremendous value. Um, so we have some questions that we're planning to ask all, three, all of our three book authors, four authors. And I'll begin with um, asking you, Maria, how you, how you got interested in this topic and how your particular positionality contributed to your research. Yeah, thanks, Nancy. So, well, um, the Coralway story, I want to say, was like a gem that fell on my lap. That's probably not a great analogy, but, I, but it was really an interesting way that it came to me. I want to just back up and say that I've been interested in bilingual education for many, many years, most if not all of my career as a teacher, as a teacher educator. Um, I was actually a Title VII fellow with the U.S. Department of Education when we had U.S. Title VII. Some people in the audience might not have that history or background, uh, but I was a Title VII at the fellow at the University of Colorado in Boulder with Kathy Escamilla in the late 1990s. And we studied bilingual education and we were uh, prepared under the US Department of Education to be bilingual education scholars and teacher educators. So I knew about Coral Way from even probably before that during my master's degree um, and being a, a teacher. Um, I had heard the name, but really when I was a Title VII fellow and I was in Boulder, I really was able to dig in as a scholar and think about bilingual education. Um, I had a very international lens. I did my dissertation work investigating bilingual education immersion programs in the Republic of Ireland for language revitalization purposes. And so that was another way of thinking about the importance of languages and identity and the intersection of those in, and the role of education for, for revitalizing language and for social justice purposes. So that's, that's sort of the background of my position, my positionality in that story. Um, but just very briefly, but most importantly in the story was the fact that in 2007 and 2008, our beloved Richard Ruiz um, collected data from the oral, for oral histories. He conducted 12 oral histories of some of the teachers and educational leaders at Coral Way at its opening in 1963 that stayed with the program for many, many years. And so he was able to collect those data before his very untimely and sad passing in 2015. And so when I learned about those data um, from a colleague, Beth Stafarber, who was in the first class at Coral Way when it became a bilingual program, Beth approached me and said, I have these oral histories mm -hmm. that were conducted by Richard Ruiz Richard thought because it's a Florida program and you're in Florida, you might like to take a look. And I said, oh my goodness. And that's, why, that's what I mean when I said it was like a jewel. That I, we had heard about Coral Way, but the story of Coral Way and what happened is just amazing. And um, it became honestly an obsession for about uh, 18 months to go through the data. I, I loved every minute of it. Yeah. Fantastic. I, I, we, we got goosebumps when we read that, you know, we had this data from Richard and it's so wonderful that you're able to, you know, include that in the book and a, a great tribute to his legacy as well. Uh, you may have partially answered this question with that answer, but, you know, in addition to that, uh, what would you say was the most memorable experience you had in carrying out your study? Oh, wow. I mean, hands down, right? The, the work that we do as scholars, as teachers, it's always about the people the people that we meet along the way, their students. And in my case, in the story of Coral Way, it's, it was all about the people that were there from the program at the beginning. I, I, I'm still thinking back of the stories I heard um, from Lourdes Rorida, from, uh, from Rosie Castro Feinberg, from um, reading the data from Mabel Richardson, who was a first grade teacher and, it's, and, and wrote her EDD dissertation from the University of Miami, of course, I didn't meet her, right? She passed away. She was Best of Farber's teacher and um, really was um, the only source of surviving data from the Coral Way program in the 1960s. Wow. Reading her dissertation was like meeting her. 
Um, so meeting people who were there and hearing them in real time share their stories. And sadly though, I mean, hearing Richard's voice on the audio recordings as he interviewed people in their oral histories in 2007 and 2008, it, it's it's a tremendous experience, and I, I you know I, I encourage anybody to go back and listen to those recordings. It's it's been a tremendous journey for me. Thank you, uh, Maria. What are the main points you hope readers take away from your book? Uh, well, uh, a couple things really importantly. Um, one of the things is clearly that um, the work that we do in bilingualism, bilingual education, um, in teacher education and, and bilingualism has, has a long history. That's really important because it's easy for us today to feel like the context in which we're at and the challenges that we face today in teacher preparation and neoliberalism mm -hmm. and those things that are affecting us really have um, threads and have come, come across over time. And so we have a story from the past that we need to, to relive and remember in order to help us move forward into the future. And so there's one, if there's one thing I'd like for people to take away, it's that there's a story here. It's not the only story. It needs, it, there's more voice, there are more voices that need to come through for sure, but, but it's worth hearing it and, and understanding where your work is, fits in, the, in that story and what that means for us as in, for, for a greater good, if you would. I think that's really important. Um, the, the one thing I'd like for people to take from there. Thank you. So I guess in a way you've answered the, the next question we had. Maybe I'll skip over it um, and I'll ask you how, oh, no, Wayne, this is marked as your question. <laughs> no, go, go ahead, Nancy. <laughs> okay. How can this book help to engage the general public in conversations about bilingualism and bilingual education in the U.S.? In other words, beyond the world of scholarship and even the world of bilingual teachers, um, how can the book engage, you know, broadly? You know, so important because um, we, we I, I feel strongly, at, I guess at this part of my career and being able to look back some period of time, right, that um, there are times in our careers that we have to work in terms of academia and doing the research and publishing um, very tight, clean studies and so on. That's really important. But I feel at this point that it's important for us to speak on, in an ongoing way to the, the general populace, to the public, so that they understand that we have a story, that there's a long history, that we have an important message. And I feel like we have to be very um, uh, thoughtful about writing for particular audiences. If anything, in this book that's pretty slim, um, I had in my mind that I'd like to, and I wrote it off using some narrative, uh, narrative writing about driving up to the school and what it felt like to enter into that space. Um, I would like the, the general public to, to be able to read the work that we do as scholars and make sense of it so that they um, can understand better uh, the, what bilingual education at the end of the day, what it really is. Because I think even in the general public, there are misconceptions about that. So I believe that the book was writing for that audience in many ways, um, maybe the chapter on data, not so much. <laughs> but I hope, I hope it makes its way into um, the general uh, narrative, the national narrative on. Yeah, on I agree that the narratives and the hearing the voices of the participants themselves is is also, I believe, a way to, to reach beyond scholarship and hopefully there, and I think the book is appealing also for its, because it's rather slim, you know, so it's not like too challenging for, for somebody to pick up and read. So um, our last question for you, if we still have time, I hope, is that- um, It's a quick one, we've got time, yeah. All right, a quick answer to, <laughs> yeah. to a big Thanks. question. What would an extension of this work, you know, look like, do you think? Um, do you have ideas of how you want it, where you want to take it or where you want to go from here? Yeah, you know, I, I, I do. Um, I really tried to unearth all of the data I could possibly find and um, found a lot from the 1960s. It was it's fascinating, but there's, there are probably many other pieces to this. One of the things that this book does not do is really take a lens of critical race and look at critical race from the perspective of Cuban immigrant children and, um, and so on. There might not be a lot of data around that, but there definitely is a lens that could be used there. And I, I would love to see scholars pick that up, work, work together, work with me, and think about um, the, 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 the lens of race on Coral Way and how that has over time affected bilingual education programs. So I, I hope someone takes up that challenge. 
Fair, yeah, that, that sounds like the per a great challenge for going forward. <laughs> so, yeah. Thanks very much, Maria. I think we'll, um, we'll move over to Kim now um, for her to introduce her book. Um, Maria, thank you so much for that introduction for all of us, because I feel exactly the same. I'm, I just feel so fortunate to be involved with Multilingual Matters, who've been just such a supportive, wonderful publisher um, as a first time author, book writer, um, so supportive and so encouraging along the way. So I just wanted to say thank you and to be able to work with Nancy Hornberger, who was like, who is like an idol to me and, and Wayne Wright from, who's from the region where the, the writing comes from, who's such a fantastic scholar. It was, and our re reviewers who were amazing. Um, I just wanna say thank you to that. Thank you to them. And it has been just an amazing experience all around. Um, here's my book. And uh, it's, a, it's an ethnography of a first year charter school in, um, in the Southwest. And it, it's where I spent three years at the school. And, uh, the, but the book is the first year of the school. How uh, I was thought it would be really interesting if I could capture how a culture developed from the ground up. And uh, I had always been interested in doing ethnography. And so the ability to have a, a great ethnographic project was super appealing to me. And, and um, it was fan a fantastic experience. And so when I was there at the school, since there was no history of the school and no like problem to explore, um, I was just, you know, very grounded theory trying to see what I was going to, to study. And what I found was after being in the school for just about a week, and the school began in a, high, in a hotel because the doors of the school were not really open for operation. So here I was in this luxurious, luxurious hotel with all these 14 and 15 year old high school students. And I came into a, a, a Spanish heritage or a advanced Spanish class. And um, I saw conjugations, verb conjugations on the board. And I thought that was a little odd, but I, I came in and had an open mind about what was going on. And then the teacher who asked me if I would take a few of the students outside to the courtyard because they were being restless. So out in the courtyard, um, they were just complaining like, oh, why am I taking this stupid class? I could be taking advanced math. I could be taking French. You know, they were just complaining. And I was trying to talk to them about like why taking uh, a Spanish class, if you're, even if you're already a Spanish speaker, it could be valuable, but they would have nothing of it. So then I was thinking, okay, here's my research question. So that's where I began the study with this discontent of these students. And fortunate for me, the students remained a cohort. So they were in their Spanish class and then they went over to their humanities class, which was social studies English. And there they were really flourishing and raising their hands and behaving and not acting out because in the Spanish class, they were very sullen in the first, in the first semester with a non-native Span or a Spanish teacher whose first language was English. They were very sullen. They would not speak to her in Spanish. Then in the second semester, they had a, a teacher from Mexico and there they were more acting out, um, being disruptive, literally lighting things on fire. Um, so I, I saw this, this uh, behavior being so different. And so the book really chronicles and tries to explore and ask questions and present live field notes and observations of why are students so engaged in this other context and why are they so disengaged, resistant in this other context? So that's where the book is. And I thought the book, also the project is, the school was super interesting because it was a small school, a charter school. So I thought that's also interesting to explore what that's about. And they did place-based learning, which I thought, wow, that's cool, place-based learning. I, that's something that I would like to learn more about. So I chronicle all of these things in the book. And then eventually I present some pedagogical ideas for the Spanish heritage language classroom gleaned from all of the, the data that I got and the conversations I had with teachers and students about what they liked, what, what, what excites them about learning. So that's also in the book. Thanks very much, Kim. And I think now Nancy and Wayne have some questions for you. Um, <clears throat> yes, I, I was just going to say that it's so important to focus on that aspect in particular of dual language education because that's the whole point, right? To, to get people engaged in 
in this case, Spanish as well as English, and to try to figure out from a really uh, practitioner point of view, what, why is it? Why is it that they were engaged or disengaged? So that's, I think, a truly valuable contribution of your book. So I'm glad you brought that out. We, um, we wanted to ask you, like with, with Maria, how did you get to be interested? You sort of told us a little bit about that, but also how you, you your person and your positionality um, contributed to this research. Sure, and I, I, I give kind of an origin story in the book too. And so uh, being in Santa Cruz, I'll say I believe in synchronicity. <laughs> so I, I feel like being involved with a project was very synchronous because um, I, it really was an accident that I, I, I ran into the school at a street fair. They had a sign, place-based mm. learning. And I came up to the booth and I was talking to one of the founding teachers who actually turns out to be the favorite teacher, Rachel, in the book. And um, so that's how I got involved. But what's interesting is that I had no idea, zero, that I would be hitting upon Spanish as a heritage language. None, because I think what I reveal in the book and maybe people know or don't know is, okay, so I am a Spanish heritage speaker. My family's from Nicaragua, and I had zero confidence in my Spanish. Me, study Spanish as a heritage language? No, well, <laughs> I'm not an expert, but of course I've lived it, so I am in, a, in my own way. But so many colleagues around the world who do this work are maybe their first language is Spanish, or they're, they've learned Spanish as a foreign language and their, their competence is you know, off the charts, they're amazing. So all of that just is so in, was so intimidating to me. So for me to select that as a project, no way. But when I was at the school, that's what came up. And um, you know, anthropologists get, you know, get criticized for navel gazing, but this was not <laughs> on purpose for me to be studying my own um, history. And then my own positionality of coming in with this about this linguistic insecurity or having this experience of discrimination in our background and, you know, um, that helps me to understand why the students were acting out, why the students were at times reluctant to speak Spanish, why there was this teasing amongst the students when they did speak Spanish. So all of that, my own experience, I can bring that. What I could not bring though is being a Mexican-American, um, all the racism, bigotry towards Mexican-Americans, I could not completely experience that because if I, when I was a little girl, people would say, they would look at my dark hair, which is now gray, but they would look at my dark hair, dark eyes, dark skin, and say like, where are you from? And I would be so confused. And then they would say, where's your mom from? Or your family from? And I'd say, oh, Nicaragua. And then they'd be like, oh, okay. Not, I don't think really realizing what Nicaragua is, where it is, what a poor country it is. It's poorer than Mexico. And so I, I think I escaped some of that bigotry and racism. I was spared it. But I still would hear things aimed at Mexicans that I knew that's, if they only knew, that's most of my family. So I can, I can bring that in, but I don't have the completely lived experience of the Mexican American, but I have a taste. So all of those things I can bring to the data, and I did, to try to understand kind of deeper feelings about language and language and identity. Beautiful, beautifully put also. Um, the sort of the insider outsider perspective in a slightly different way than, than you often hear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The, um, let's see. Oh, what was the most memorable experience you had in carrying out your study? There's so many things, but one thing, I, I, I open each chapter with a vignette of the field notes. And, and I'll actually, um, those are kind of like those memorable moments. So each chapter opens in that way from a camping trip to a field excursion. And, and this is the one that, that I still have in my memory, it's still burned in my memory, is in the third year of the school, we had a field trip, we. Uh, <laughs> I'm still an insider. <laughs> uh, we had a field trip to uh, see the Dalai Lama. And so the whole school went, 
and I was a chaperone and that was kind of my contribution as a researcher. I was always a chaperone on the trips. And uh, we arrived and we were there early and we saw the Dalai Lama come out of his limousine with Secret Service and came out. And there were protesters with signs that were, you know, supposedly Christians saying, you know, there's only one way and criticizing Buddhism. And the Dalai Lama went to one of these protesters and he bowed to them and smiled and just, you know, just, did, I don't even know if he said anything. It was just a, a blessing, you know. And that, that protester jaw dropped, you know? So it's like coming to people who despise you or hate you and coming with respect and love was something that is just burned into my mind. And, and in this time when we have so much conflict and so much hate in our country, I think that's just such a, an incredible lesson to, uh, to not hate each other, but to just acknowledge there's a difference and just, and, and not cause any more conflict and be peaceful. So that was something that I will not, and normally I start crying when I think about this, but um, I wrote about it in the, in the book. And uh, so that was something that was really rem memorable, memorable. And then another thing that I also write in one of the final chapters is after all these years of being at the school, I, I, I returned. And seeing the first school where we were first in a hotel and there was chaos, really, there, it was very chaotic. And then to come back all these years later and to see such a peaceful, loving school and going to one of the open meetings that I would always attend and there I went to the open meeting and students were just peacefully sitting. They were honoring um, DACA students. At that time, there was some controversy around DACA. And then some students came and played the guitar and it was just such a loving experience. And then one of the students that had been in the original study, kind of more tangential, but she's in one of the chapters, she ended up being one of the teachers at the school, you know, an art teacher. So it was like, oh my gosh, um, so that was really memorable to know that this experiment of a school, that it really flourished and that students were um, the seeds of that loving spirit. I saw the, the, you know, the tree, the plant, the flowers, that it really took form and shape. And so that was really heartwarming and that's something that I will always remember. And I, I write about that in the book as well. Thank you. Um, how Thank about, you, Kendra. Yes, thank you. There's, there's, I remember that story really well about the Dalai Lama and the many other wonderful stories that you've captured in there. So thank you for that. There was a request that we hold up the book again. So I'm going to just hold that up. while I ask the next question uh, so people can see that. But uh, what are the main points you hope readers take away from your book? Um, well, I mean, for the, in general, just for us to value the heritage learner and the speaker and, and that, you know, we, we come in, come in with all these languages, yet we forget them K through 12. If we're not lucky enough to be in a bilingual education setting or dual language, then we have to relearn those languages in college if we have the opportunity to go to college. So for people, learners and parents and families in the society to value all the languages that we bring into this country, that would be amazing. If we could have a language policy that embraced those languages and incorporated them into the curriculum. Yeah. is a pipe dream, I hope, but maybe, maybe we will evolve and, and honor those languages and culture in the future. Um, for like the teachers and academics who read the book, um, I really hope that they, I have a pedagogy chapter and um, I have been teaching English as an academic language for many, many years. And I borrow on some of those lessons for teaching um, content-based instruction. And I, include the idea of place-based learning. And I'm just hoping that people will kind of let go of the textbook <laughs> more and more and more and create curriculum that's more community, uh, place-based um, community, including which I call Pueblo in the book, Pueblo meaning the town and Pueblo meaning the people that we really include student voices, families and community into the curriculum of Spanish or any other language uh, but it's in particular heritage language instruction that the because the students in the book hated the textbook because it was so disconnected yeah. from their lives. And if we can try to create curriculum that's more connected to student life experience, be it in high school, elementary school, university, and just get away from the standardized curriculum, you can have some of it, of course. 
but developing your own curriculum that's centered on students' uh, interests and their own communities. I would, that would just be amazing if, if that, I, we do that a lot in ESL, but if we could do that more in the foreign language or the heritage language classroom, um, I think that would be wonderful. Amen to that. <laughs> well said. <laughs> So uh, next question, what was it like to go back to high school? Oh, so, so, sorry to, to ahead, um, cut in. Sorry, yes, I think we probably have to move on to Katie and Deb now. So we're a little bit rushed for time. But thank you so much for that, Kim. That's really interesting. Um, so yeah, I would, I would pass over to Katie and Deb now to introduce their book. Okay, well, I'm going to start. Um, so first of all, uh, yes, I've got the book too. Um, I just wanted to um, say thanks to everyone for uh, organizing this. And I wanted to start by saying that the reason why this um, book was written was really because of Wayne Wright. Um, so I don't know if you remember it, but you came up. I was um, awarded by the bilingual research SIG at AERA for my, I was given an award for my dissertation. And Wayne said, well, did you think about turning it into a book? And no, I had never thought that I would be capable of, you know, being a, an, an author of a book. And, um, and so he said, well, think about it. And I did. And the more I thought about it, the more I decided that um, I didn't want to turn my dissertation into a book. I wanted to turn the larger ethnographic project that I had been involved in for um, almost five years into a book. And so I wrote Deb and said, Deb, would you want to write the book, um, a, a book that kind of builds on, on the whole work that we did for um, when I was doing my, my PhD work? So really, um, and I'll, I'll just share like another story about, about the fortuitous nature of how this book ended up in existence. So I started my um, PhD in 2010, and I had recently moved um, back from uh, Guadalajara, Mexico, where I had been teaching a, in a dual language program. And I was really excited about studying dual language implementation. And so my first year there, I was very, you know, super excited to be in the PhD. And I said, well, does anyone, is anyone doing dual language implementation? And I remember Deb saying, <laughs> well, actually, I just started this, you know, IRB to study dual language implementation because a district is about to start it district wide in 2010. So um, I, that was how the whole project started. Um, I immediately started um, on the project in 2010 and then um, we, we, we followed what happened from the very beginning and, and, and all the way till, um, you know, till I graduated and, Another kind of, and I'll pass it to Deb to, to talk a little bit more about the structure of the book, but um, another thing is that some of the teachers that were in the book, we still um, are in touch with. And actually one of the, the case studies in the book, Monica Tejas, we just revisited our 2010 data and have a, a new chapter coming out to talk about sort of that amazing work that she did that, um, that is also highlighted in the book, so. Anyway, that data, in fact, um, Katie collected in her first year as a doctoral student, the data that we revisited. So this has been a long project. So um, I'm, I'm Deb Palmer. <laughs> I, um, I started this with Katie and several other doctoral students and a master's student in 2010 as a project. It took five years over which we were collecting data during this rich experience throughout this large urban district that had done dual language implementation like head on um, all at once practically. Um, and uh, then there were about five years more while Katie and I got our heads around the idea of making a book and she had two young babies and my family moved from Texas. I was at UT Austin during this study to now I'm in, in Boulder, Colorado. So. Um, so writing this book really was a journey for both of us. Uh, and it's been a journey um, for us both as researchers and as people. I mean, we're, we're uh, both uh, former dual language teachers and bilingual in Spanish, um, but we've never been involved in something quite this scale. And I'll just say this book ended up being um, case studies about teachers, right? So it's really, uh, excuse my cat, sorry. Um, unlike, <laughs> unlike um, I, unlike the other two books that you just heard about, this book is really a focus on, on teachers' lives themselves. Uh, we, we decided to, to look at teachers because, um, well, at, in a real way, they're at the heart of implementation of a dual language. Even if the district is trying to do it district-wide, you've got teachers at the heart of every classroom 
thinking and acting upon their own ideologies and their own uh, life histories that brought them to this point, engaging with kids and with families and with administration and with programs and curriculum. And that was the story that interested us most. So our book ended up being, um, along with some uh, material about the larger study and the story of how this district enveloped this uh, dual language program, or didn't in some ways. Um, it's a story of six teachers who approached this task in very different ways. Um, and their separate stories um, kind of drive the narrative of the book so that we have several tensions that emerge across the different teachers' experiences. Tensions due to standardized curriculum and high stakes testing. Tensions due to teachers' own histories and ideologies that, that were brought to bear and uh, their lack of or, or having of uh, background training and experiences that allowed them to speak up more or less vocally. So uh, with that, I'll, we'll go on to different questions. But um, so that that's a short overview of what our book is trying to do. Thanks very much, Katie and Deb and the guest appearance from the cat. Um, now <laughs> let's move over to Nancy and Wayne to ask you some questions. Sure. I, I don't know if you want to say more about um, how you got interested in the topic and your own positionality. You both have said quite a bit about that, but I, I, I want to give you space I, if you want to. Yeah, I, I would actually. So as a white scholar, I often get asked, you know, how, how did you get involved in bilingual education and, um, and in, in dual language in particular? And, and, and it, uh, my story is different from the story that a, a Spanish heritage speaker or a Latina scholar would have. But I came into this with a passion for language education and a desire to serve the kids in my own classrooms um, in California and where I was a bilingual teacher. And I came into dual language as a sort of more authentic or stronger version of bilingual ed, even from the very beginning. And as I've learned more about it, I've become more and more interested in the ways that these program models, these sort of ideas about bilingual ed that were in many ways um, articulated by by scholars in our field like like yourself, Nancy, and like Richard Ruiz, um, and like Kathy Escamilla, who I'm lucky enough to count as a colleague here now at CU Boulder. Um, these ideas kind of manifest in uh, classrooms and engagements among kids and teachers, and I've kind of always been fascinated by, by that. This um, study fell into my lap, literally. I was already involved as an advocate in the school district, as a future parent, uh, as a current parent, actually, at that time, of kids in this school district. And the district said, let's do dual language in 64 of our schools. And <laughs> it was like a researcher salivating, you know, it was like, and then Katie came along to study her dissertation, her doctoral work and said, is anybody doing research on implementation of dual language? <laughs> Anything to add to that, Katie? Well, no, but I was just reflecting a bit. I mean, I think that my identity in many ways actually is similar to Deb's as a white scholar, bilingual, who was a sequential bilingual. I think that my own linguistic privilege that I experience in my life all the time, I'm you know, in a bilingual, bicultural family, we actually speak predominantly Spanish in my household um, and and the privileges that I um, receive as a, as a white Spanish speaker when I speak Spanish, so different from my partner who engages in Spanish and English and receives no credit. So I think that, that positionality is something that fuels my, um, you know, fuels my research, fuels my interest, sometimes, you know, fuels my like frustration and, and, um, and, and, to, and to figure out how to, you know, contribute. Um, and have important perspectives and voices heard. Thank you both for that. And, and a follow up, which you've already heard us ask the other authors is, do you want to tell us about a memorable experience you had in your field work, in your research? All right, so I, we were talking about this yesterday. Deb and I talked through all these questions yesterday. And we were like, it was a you know five year ethnography. Like there were so many, how do you talk about it? Um, and it wasn't until listening um, to Maria and Kim that I actually thought about um, a memory that that really stands out when we were in that in that first year. And I remember going in, and, and the district was doing, you know, district wide 
over 60 schools from you know one year to the next everyone's doing dual language and the model they were using was um, a model of strict language separation which is something we talk a lot about in the book and how did the teachers navigate that with their own bilingual identities that didn't necessarily make sense and i remember going into um I, my first teacher was selected purposefully because she was a master bilingual teacher and i was like oh i'm gonna go learn and see what she's doing so I walked in the classroom and immediately she's not separating her language, right? And she's engaging in these <laughs> bilingual practices. And I had just come, you know, from teaching in Mexico where like, you know, it, it was really important. They, you know, they really wanted us to keep our language separate. And I remember kind of just going to Deb. I can, I can even remember some of the specific conversations we had where I was like, like, how do we make sense of this? And, um, and is like, like what is this right is it not right like at the time I think there was at, this is 2010 like translanguaging was really not a thing and um I remember Deb said well there's this new concept of translanguaging that maybe will make will help us make sense of it and and we did um and I I remember that and it was such a uh, it was such a powerful experience to now revisit it and think about it and say you know, these, you know, amazing master Latina bilingual teachers in Texas, they've been doing translanguaging pedagogy for, you know, a lot longer. We just now get to name it and empower it and say that this is, um, you know, that this is, this is, this is the, at the heart of bilingual education is allowing students to engage bilingually. And Dev and I talk about that a lot, right, in, in terms of, um, right, like how bilingual education should be serving bilingual students. Right. Wow, that's yeah. a timely experience to, I mean, that's a timely story. Very timely. Thank you. Uh, Wayne, over to you. Great. So uh, what are the main points you hope readers take away from your book? So, um, Katie, you were going to pull up our key questions, right? Um, we are, we kind of envisioned this book as a, a possible tool for uh, schools and districts, teachers, who are implementing dual language um, at whatever scale, you know, as a thought piece to help people think through um, some of the different issues and uh, challenges and, and possibilities that pop up as you're in the middle of this very messy process. And we came up with some guiding um, sort of recommendations or really questions at the end that could possibly help uh, people to make sense in their own contexts, because of course it's extremely contextual. That's I think one of the primary messages of the book every teacher uh, deals with their own context in their own ways. So hopefully these questions that we did come up with were, were more universal. I don't know if you want to um, go there, Kate, Katie, but... Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just read a few. Um, how well does your dual language program serve and center linguistically marginalized emerging bilingual students and their families? How does your dual language program value and validate diverse language practices that include hybrid and non-standard ways of engaging bilingually? How does your dual language bilingual education program actively work to mitigate English dominance? Um, to what extent do teachers at your school have the agency and preparation to make informed decisions regarding language policy to support their students by literacy development? And how does your dual language bilingual education program support and develop positive and affirming bilingual identity? So there's a really <laughs> hard test at the end of the book. <laughs> Those are really awesome questions. And um, I think that kind of answers the next question about who do you think the most likely audience of your book is? You know, um, asking those kinds of questions, getting them to look at these great case studies and, and think about their own. And then maybe you can uh, talk more about what was it like working together as a co authors on this book? And how did you make that process work and be successful? That's a really good question. Um, I. Um, I'm fairly new to the book writing process myself, and I have um, Nancy and Wayne and the Multilingual Matters team to thank for bringing me into that process. My own uh, first book was only a couple of years ago um, based on a different project, uh, but and it was a, a sole author book. So writing a book as a team, I, I wasn't sure what to expect, but the truth is that Katie and I have been working as a team since she entered the doctoral program in her first year. Um, yes, I've been her, her advisor and her, the supervisor of her dissertation and a mentor in many ways, but uh, we are also co-authors on, on a number of other pieces. So the process of writing the book was like a, a big article to me. It, was, uh, um, it went smoothly, 
what, anything to add, Katie? I, I really think as a team, we, um, we complement each other because we, right. we have similar questions but bring different tools <laughs> to the table. Well, and something that I remember was that I was actually sort of advised against it a little bit um, because I... By me. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I think that, you know, I mean, I was approached to write it as a solo author on my dissertation. And I said, why would I do that if I think that the book that we need for teachers would be stronger if I write it with Deb? And they were like, well, because you are going to always be in her shadow. And I was like, I don't mind if I'm always in Deb's shadow. Like, I will <laughs> happily remain... Uh, so I said, no, like this is, this will be a stronger book. And Deb and I do, you know, I think work well together and um, it's, yeah. So it was definitely the right choice. And I, I think that the book is um, hopefully a strong tool. I did, I was going to just mention our cases do, are very, are chosen very differently. So we, we have cases yeah. where teachers were asked to implement the program and they really didn't they struggle. It just didn't happen. And that, a lot of that was from standardized testing pressure. And we talk about it in the book. And then we have cases where the teachers implemented it with as much fidelity as they could. And the tensions that that surfaced for them and some of those issues. And then the, um, the final case study chapter is about the two um, teachers who really said, okay, we like this program model, but we're going to adapt it to fit our context and serve our students. And the, they, they happen to be the most experienced bilingual teachers who had that long history in their, in their um, context. So, so I, think that, I think that the book can really show the different kinds of um, struggles that different kinds of teachers can have in different contexts. So um, I'll stop there. Well, I'll also say that uh, collaborating on the book that we actually took lead on different chapters. So the, the book is about the whole study in some places. A couple of the chapters really touch on um, the larger study. And, and I, uh, I took lead on, on writing those, right? And um, writing the, the, the literature review of, of bilingual education, we offer a, a, a different kind of take on the history of bilingual ed and how it led to this place of dual language in district-wide implementation formats, you know. Um, but the, the case study chapters were really all Katie in their data that she was a big part of collecting. Um, and I, um, I was a part of collecting data and other pieces of the study, you know, but these cases of teachers, that was the heart of what Katie's dissertation was about, about looking at teachers' um, own ideologies and the impact of those. So I think the book is a balance of both of us in that way. Fantastic. Well, it came together beautifully. So thanks for sharing that. Flo, we've got about 10 minutes left, so how do you want to proceed? Yes, I think probably if we kind of skip maybe straight to the questions from the audience, that might be the easiest if everyone's happy with that. So yeah, um, yeah great. So I'll start off with a, a kind of more general uh, question that anyone is free to answer. Um, this is from Sibel, I apologize for any mispronunciation of your name there, um, who asks, how can we provide or optimize education practices in multilingual contexts? So that's open to anyone who wants to chip in. Maybe Maria? Can you just re repeat that? I want to make sure I can. Yeah, 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 absolutely. How can, we, how, can we <laughs> how can we provide or optimize education practices in multilingual contexts? Well, um, I, I'm sure every panelist uh, here has something important to say. Um, you know, um, I'll just maybe start us off because we could probably talk for a long time about that. But um, the fact of the matter is that multilingual children are multilingual, bilingual children are bilingual, multilingual. Um, and so starting with from that premise is a really important um, space um, to think about languages and the, their importance for learning. Um, one of the questions that came up along the way was um, in terms of, of core way, the separation of languages, I think is a field where talking about ways that languages uh, really uh, work together in concert um, uh, to support uh, overall linguistic growth. So I think that is one way to think about teaching and learning and multilingual students is um, that they are not monolinguals. Um, and it's an old premise, but it's still true today, you know. I think what Maria is touching on is that the, this, the program uh, is best devised if started with the kids, like who your kids are, what your kids do with language, and um, what kinds of worlds they live in is the starting place for any strong curriculum. And Kim's book is a really good example of that as well. Um, the, or your ideas about possible futures for curriculum that could be stronger, um, more project-centered and context-centered. 
So program models are really artificial structures set up to kind of house these things. But in a way, I think the strongest programs start with the kids and the worlds they live in and develop a program that suits that space. Yeah, I was just gonna say, every program is different and should be different and sort of mm -hmm. to not have an expectation that you will follow any particular recipe or uh, like model. Because I think the ways we can improve bilingual or multilingual education for multilingual context is to pay attention to the context, as, as both of the previous people were saying, focusing on the kids, but also on the worlds they live in, as Deb said, how the, the school itself, how it's the teachers, the kinds of you know, resources that you have to work with, it all, it all feeds into designing a program that's, that's going to be the best for that place. The education is also important, where teachers feel empowered to develop curriculum, where they're not hand tied to a certain curriculum or a, a, a textbook model that that in and teacher education programs, you know that the teachers creativity can become unleashed on how to work with students on communities and to how to develop curriculum and to be given the tools on how how to develop curriculum. Um, I think that would be important. So, you know, understanding the, the context and communities that your students come from, but then you need to develop curriculum that's going to engage. So you need to have the skills and the training to understand how to develop assessments and curriculum and all of those things. So I think it's a huge pack. It's a big package that um, to really honor the students language and, and the, um, what they bring to the classroom. Thanks very much. And um, we've got a question from Catherine for Katie and Deb. How do teachers answer the question of what they actively do to mitigate English dominance? Katie, you want to tackle that? Well, I, I mean, I, I think that it was handled differently by different teachers. Um, and in um, one of the cases, we did um, see the way that the standardized testing sort of derailed the program model and um, teachers uh, from a lot of pressures from you know district and their school leaders were making choices to engage in standardized test preparation that was monolingual instead of engaging so in Texas and you know Texas is a I think a particularly uh, challenging place for this um, you sometimes saw you know the disappearance of social studies disappearance of science and um, and just focusing on English reading arts and and math and so Sometimes, that, yeah, so that, that's one side of it. Um, but the teachers that were successful in mitigating English dominance uh, were for two reasons. First of all, they were um, centering, you know, the linguistically marginalized students in their classroom by making sure that their classroom space was a place for them, right? And that these programs serve them. If you are, you know, and so, and, and that was facilitated in a lot of our context because, um, Another interesting thing about about the Texas is that they have they have what they call one way dual language and two way dual language, and the program models can get really complicated. But the one way programs were really serving entirely English language learners, so something that might be considered um, a, a maintenance program. Um, but this was called one way dual language in, in our context, and so in those in in that way, um, the English dominance was less of a factor which um, is, is sort of interesting. Uh, and then in the two-way context, it's, and you know, and, and uh, Deb has a wonderful research about, right, this is making sure that um, the voices of students who um, uh, are oftentimes sort of centered, the teacher, there's many pedagogical ways and tools to make sure that that doesn't um, happen. No, the only thing I'll add to that is that it's a constant struggle that all the teachers, um, are well aware of <laughs> so that it doesn't go away. And it, sometimes even when everything is uh, carried out in Spanish, there's a sense in which the teachers feel guilty about using Spanish when they should be teaching English. Um, there's always the presence of this English dominant society. And I think it emerges in, in um, a, a wide range of ways. Great, thanks very much. Uh, we've got a question for Kim from A. Senor. So again, sorry about any pronunciation problems there. Um, do you think including heritage languages in school curricula might affect heritage language learners' identities positively? 
Oh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I mean, there's so much, I mean, I, I, I've experienced this, you know, you, you have this stigma. I mean, I didn't even, sorry to personalize this, but I didn't even study Spanish. I didn't even, it, I mean, it was like Spanish in the United States, it's just such a, it's marginalized and the people are marginalized and you don't feel honored or respected. So, of course, if we were to feel that way, I mean, my, my career, I mean, I, I love, my career's fine, but I mean, there were so many other opportunities that I didn't, wasn't able to do. And, and that would be the same for so many students and children. So yeah, I mean, it's when we have Mexican origin students dropping out of high school at the highest num with the highest numbers, we really need to have some other strategies and understand what's going on in our schools when they're, when they are feeling disrespected. So uh, absolutely. Um, all the heritage languages that come into our schools, you know, how can we embrace them? How can we include them into our curriculum? I, absolutely, I 100% I, I agree with that, that it affects your psyche and for sure, yeah. Thanks very much, Kim. And then we've got one last question for Maria. Uh, it was actually asked earlier on the on the chat function, and you did you went into it a bit, Maria. But maybe you'd like to elaborate um, about the model being far too simplistic for the complex web of learner backgrounds today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So interesting about Coral Way, right? So it, it was truly an experiment in 1960. One and 62 when they thought about developing this quote model right and implementing it in 1963 through basically 1967 and 68 and what happened at the beginning was the uh, founders of the of the program um, decided that they would take spanish-speaking children and put them in first language instruction in the morning in classes in spanish and then they would switch sometime loosely in the middle of the day and do english in the afternoon and English background students would be in homeroom class and do English in the morning and then switch in the afternoon, right? So there was a separation of children. But when we think about children today, um, at, like in 1963, children don't fit into very neat little boxes, do they? So even at, right away, the teachers realized, well, first of all, they didn't have screeners, so they didn't think about first language literacy. There was the context of, of Miami and Cuban refugee children who might have come to the United States, been educated in California, returned to Miami, ended up in Coalway. So they had literacy in English, but were first language speakers of Spanish. You can see immediately the complexity surrounding language decisions and placement for these children. Um, the, the, the original quote model, if there was one, was that the middle of the day was relaxed time where children could integrate loosely and they could kind of play on the playground and not worry about language, right? There was just this pressure taken off of them. But again, the idea was that um, they, the teachers originally and leaders thought that they could do this and within about 18 months realized it wasn't that neat. Um, in fact, people I, I see noticing talking about languaging and translanguaging and we were looking at really uber lingual spaces like, for example, South Africa, um, where there really is no way to name kids L1, L2, L3, because kids are like multiple languages they speak all the time. Um, we can see how complex language use really is in reality. So this is something that, was, that we struggle with uh, across, I think, many models. Um, and it was certainly the case way back in 1963. Great. Thanks very much, Maria. Um, so I'm afraid that's all we've got time for uh, today, but thank you so much to all of our panelists for joining us uh, for this experimental online event. And thank you very much for everybody watching at home all over the world. Um, we really appreciate your support. And we hope that uh, it'll be the first of a series of events like this. Um, seems like it's been a success. So uh, just one last thing for me before we finish is uh, that we are offering a 50% discount on all the books that we've discussed this evening or this morning, wherever you are. Um, so all you need to do is use the code ATA50 on our website to get 50% off. Thanks very much and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you participants Thank you, for your chat messages. That was awesome. Thank you <laughs> for all the awesome questions.